students. Then he did his MPhil and PhD from JNU under the great historian Bipan Chandra. After that, Professor Nanda delved himself into teaching and research, and he is a prolific writer, publishing books such as Vocalizing Silence by the Sage Publishers, then seven other books, dozens of articles in national and international journals. Moreover, Professor Nanda received the prestigious Charles Wallace Fellowship not only once but twice, a rare feat among an Indian. Then he also received many other projects like German Research Council, then World Health Organization project, then on leprosy project from Oxford University. So Professor Nanda is a well-known historian having international repute and we are really privileged to hear from such a great historian. And he will be speaking on legacy of the national movement. Our national movement, one of the unique features was that it was not only a fight against the British colonialism, but also it strived to have a equitable social and economic order after India gets independence. So the ideas like secularism, independent foreign policy, democratization, civil liberties, all have a background in our national movement. And Professor Nanda will be telling in detail about this. So I request Professor Nanda to speak something about the topic. Professor Nanda. Thank you very much, uh, sir and Professor uh, Mr for these generous words about me, which uh, I may not possibly deserve. Um, but once again, I would like to thank you from the core of my heart for this uh, kind and uh, generous words. Uh, having said this, uh, let me quickly uh, welcome all these audience uh, of this session uh, with the hope that we are going to have a, a you know lively interactive session uh, for the next couple of minutes. Uh, um, in view of this uh, technological problem and also um, the delayed response of the audience in, in terms of uh, attending this virtual class. Now, uh, as Professor Misra has rightly pointed out that my job is to you know discuss uh, with you and also we'll have a discussion entirely uh, as a, uh, also collectively we'll take up this discussion on trying to map the legacy of the Indian national movement particularly. That is what uh, we are supposed to be dealing with uh, in this uh, 40 or uh, 50 minutes. Uh, uh, but before getting into the whole realm of, uh, you know, ideas, uh, which can be you know very clearly thought that these are the legacies these are the you know uh, ideas which have really uh, been the kind of uh, assets to which we always look forward to uh, as something of the past which has come for a, from a long time and continues to inspire us you know some of the ideas some of the values of uh, uh, of the yester years, you know, when our uh, earlier generations, uh, when our forefathers fought against a mighty empire about whom we have learned in terms of stories, that there was a, a sort of uh, a very mighty rule called British, who ruled us for more than 200 years, I mean, almost like 200 years. And we as Indians fought against this, uh, this power and when we fought against this power, we used lot many conceptual ideas, a uh, lot many political thinking, and also we adopted a strategy, we adopted some kind of perspective. We thought through this power, we thought through our enemies, then we developed a strategy, we developed a perspective, and we fought back this enemy. And after, you know, trying, uh, after being after having succeeded in driving out this particular power or this enemy or this ruler to their own country, 
then we started building up our own nation called Indian nation right since the days of you know 15th August 1947 which we called uh, the modern Indian nation the foundation of modern Indian nation was laid on that particular you know, August day so when we laid this foundation when we tried to you know put in some ideas put in some resources uh, and we also had some kind of imagination of this uh, India which is to come up you know after 47 uh, whether uh, it is the Prime Minister Nehru or subsequently other Prime Ministers who led this nation uh, for almost now for almost 70 years uh, the, how far we have uh, succeeded that is one question the next question could be possibly whether we have tried to follow some of the ideals some of the values some of the you know uh, major thinking which inspired the indians when we fought against this british or fought against a colonial rule what you, what we call that we had a anti colonial struggle and the legacy of this anti colonial colonial struggle has been very rich so when we fought against this British, or when we had this anti-colonial struggle, whether some of these ideas which inspired us then, did it continue with us in these last 70 years? That is precisely what we need to be very seriously reflecting in this class. Uh, whether this legacy, whether this tradition of thought, whether these ideas which inspired this anti-colonial movement uh, in the, in the pre-47 context, is there a kind of continuity, it still continues in what shape, in what form, to what extent? These are the questions, I think possibly a theme like, you know, mapping the legacy of national movement could possibly, could need to deal about, you know, need to talk about, need to, need to at least reflect on. So as Ramit and uh, uh, Professor Mishra has very, uh, sternly rather than very pointedly reminded me that it has to be bilingual but both in English and Rodia. So I'd request all of you, the students particularly, whenever you have a problem, you just simply intervene instead of waiting till the end. If you have any questions, if you have any query, if you have any doubts, any observations, just do chip in and start asking this. Uh, start throwing your ideas so that we can take up from that point and keep discussing these questions instantly without waiting for the last moment. And you can also tell me to speak in uh, Odia if you don't understand. But as long as you don't say, I'll assume that uh, you're understanding, so I'll continue with that. Maybe I can switch in between, but th this, could be the, this should be the format of uh, my uh, lecturing for another couple of minutes. Now let me come back to this point when I say that uh, how far, to what extent, in what form, in what measure that we have retained some of these uh, intellectual resources, some of these conceptual ideas which inspired us, which inspired us as, as a people when we fought against the British or when we fought against this anti-colonial movement. And to know this, uh, I would always try to privilege one aspect that students like you, the modern citizens of India, who, you know, proudly call yourself as the, you know, forward looking citizens of Indian, or maybe not citizens only, but netizens, because you are more familiar with uh, web and net. So instead of citizen, this concept of netizens are doing ground these days. So the idea of citizenry has been replaced to a large extent. But whether you are a citizen or netizen, uh, the question remains, are we really trying to be informed about our own past, past as a nation? We are the product of a post-colonial nation. We are the citizens or netizens of a post-colonial nation because we are the people of post-47 India, uh, whether you were born in 90s or 80s, you, you are at least, uh, you, you can trace your uh, 
history of India to a post-colonial context um, that you are the product of a modern India, independent India. And when you try to locate yourself as, as a citizen of this post-colonial nation, the question remains uh, whether this post-colonial nation has retained or has maintained a kind of connect between that uh, kind of colonial India when the Indians fought against this colonialism and with some of their uh, vision, some of their ideological pers persuasion, whatever inspired them to fight against the British at that point, whether these values are still continuing or it has taken a different tone. That is the question that we, uh, in the context of legacy that we need to discuss. This is the, this could be the introduction. Now, what is the character of Indian national movement? That is the first question which should trouble any anyone studying history or trying to do modern Indian history or South Asian history or trying to understand modernity in the context of South Asia should always be troubled by this, should always be at least uh, not troubled, but at least should be inquisitive of the fact that what kind of uh, nation we got and uh, what kind of struggle we really had against the British. What was the character of this struggle? What is the character of this anti-colonial movement? That is the question which which seriously begs a kind of critical consideration. That is what you need to always think about. What kind of movement? Whether this movement is uh, almost like French Revolution, whether it's like Chinese Revolution, whether it's like Russian Revolution, whether it's like Vietnamese Revolution, whether it's like Hitler's Germany, that uh, India was like Hitler's Germany, or it's a kind of uh, rule as it uh, was there in China. There are many questions which uh, comes to mind. When we try to evaluate our own national movement, how do we look at it? How do we compare it? Because we have been told, or we have almost uh, been accepting this fact, that we always try to do or think about the history of uh, French Revolution. We talk about Napoleon. We remember so many things about French Revolution. We, we do a course on Russian history. We do a course on Chinese history. While doing this, have we really been very serious about doing a course about Indian national movement? Of course, we are doing it as modern Indian uh, as students of modern Indian history, you are doing it. But uh, the way the French Revolution, Chinese Revolution, or uh, Russian Revolution, the way they have been theorized, whether Indian, Re Indian Revolution or Indian National Movement has been theorized or not, that we have never thought about very seriously. That's a major problem with our understanding of National Movement, that we tend to think of Indian National Movement in terms of a struggle like it was laid by sometime by Tilak, sometime by Gokhale, sometime by Badruddin Tabji, sometime by you know uh, Sardar Patel, sometime by Gandhi. These are some of the you know plus some of the ideas which keeps coming to uh, us when we try to think about Indian national movement in, or the character of anti-colonial movement. We have never thought that uh, that there is a kind of uh, strategy perspective underlying this national movement. There was a kind of uh, very strong, you know, vision which inspired this movement. There was a kind of ideological, you know, orientation of this movement. That is somewhere, is not very seriously articulated. Whatever writings you study in about in the national movement, you see it in terms of some uh, uh, you know kind of you know stages of movement or some phases of movement whether moderates extremist gandhi and then uh, uh, like communist socialist uh, then there is a uh, you know partisan politics there is a communal politics muslim league hindu mahasabha then there is um, you know whole you know kind of problem with uh, hindu mahasabha muslim league uh, demand of pakistan then partition of India, then how India was partitioned, 
all these kind of there are several stages phases some aspects there is some uh, you know constitutional aspects of this movement like uh, uh, swaraj's or uh, you know congress ministry of 1937 39 so we tend to see national movement in terms of different uh, aspects different dimensions different stories different narratives like this but we have never i mean there has been very little effort in trying to understand this movement in terms of a kind of struggle which had a strategic perspective which had a ideological orientation which had a long term perspective this has not been theorized even though the question about national movement is that that i mean the, the one of the major uh, uh, characteristic feature about the in, about national indian national movement or anti colonial movement is that that many of these ideas which kept developing alongside the movement in the course of the movement finally gave it a kind of structure ideological structure a kind of uh, you know framework within which we can understand that there was a kind of you know inbuilt development of a kind of framework within the within in the movement itself in other words what i mean to say that uh, when we see the dynamics of uh, you know what you call these early nationalists like uh, the the nature of congress politics or the nature of uh, Indian National Congress from 1885 to 1905, which is conventionally called the phase of moderates, then you see that they believed in constitutionalist policies. They didn't uh, try to oppose British very strongly. They demanded few things from the British. They said, "Give us this. Uh, don't put so much of tax on the Indians. Try to uh, do something for the education. Make people educated, and uh, you know, give us uh, Tilak, uh, for example." Uh, Gokhale said, uh, "Suraj is important." Then, from 1905 to 1920, we saw Tilak, uh, you know, uh, started becoming very vocal in terms of the fact that Suraj is my birth uh, right, something like that. So, idea of self-rule became very prominent, and uh, so also the political method. Instead of only uh, appealing or petitioning or praying the British. now uh, there was a kind of uh, political practice there was a kind of political strategy political method where people started demanding you know give us uh, this otherwise you'll go for dharna give us that otherwise you'll go for strike we'll uh, try to be very assertive we'll you know try to make a dharna stage dharna demonstration ban the swadeshi movement of 1905 onwards and till 1920 the revolutionary politics you see that there is more of militancy more of you know kind of pressure which is getting built up you know which was not earlier there in the in the political praxis in the political practice so from a positionality of you know trying to appease trying to request trying to petition trying to pray trying to persuade or the politics of 3p persuasion petition prayer you find suddenly a kind of uh, you know po political ecosystem where these demands are being articulated give us this that otherwise we'll try to put pressure and this continues till 1920 when there is a you know great change in the political climate when gandhi arrives in the scene uh, and gandhi quickly uh, makes a whirlwind tour of india you know whether it is champaran whether it is kheda whether it is you know Ahmedabad. He goes to many places, try to see the conditions of the people. Uh, he was earlier in South Africa, had been trained in England. He had understood the, the Western uh, world, its politics, how politics is organized there, and how people demand for their own rights. And uh, he understands how Indians has been subjugated, how Indians are being exploited, how Indians being being deprived of their rights. with that understanding he comes to india makes a whirlwind tour of india go, goes uh, and visits almost all parts of this country in the third class compartment these are familiar stories with which you are absolutely very clear 
so then gandhi tries to you know be in a position where he thinks that something very seriously needs to be done about india and he thinks that uh, his job is to make people realize one thing that there is only one major enemy of this country that is british how to develop their consciousness how to enhance their political moral ideological uh, you know thinking about this rule or this or, or this particular structure called colonialism how to how to develop this how to develop this uh, consciousness how to make people think that british is really exploitative and while doing this while trying to develop his strategy he is trying to see what kind of politics so far has been played by the moderates and so far have been played by the extremists and the revolutionary you know nationalists so he banks up on these political practices banks up on these political ideas he tries to incorporate these you know political strategies and formulates his own strategy and this becomes non non cooperation non violent kind of thing but most important aspect of this uh, than this uh, political practice or than this political strategy is 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 like you know kind of uh, a method a political method which can be described as has been described by some of the eminent historians on national movement like uh, you know there should be pinchandra and others that it's a long term uh, hegemonic struggle he describes this movement as a long term hegemonic struggle and he tries to show how struggle which can be best described as struggle to struggle that means uh, international congress international congress undertook a struggle which continued with some kind of mass movement for some time then it withdrew or this then it remained suspended for some time then again another phase of mass movement picked up for example you had non cooperation followed by there is a lull there is a kind of you know you know withdrawal of this movement after chauri chaura in 1922 again in 1930s you saw civil disobedience movement and from 30 to 34 this movement continued 34 Was again a silence. Then again, 40, 41 is the individual civil disobedience movement. 42 is the Quit India movement. So there is a struggle followed by truce or what you call Odia Rajota Kante or Sandhiko, but understanding where British Sangha is. Out of that, who knows what a struggle is? Both local Kante, it is Jamaru got a thick politics. No, it is Gandhi got a thick got a which compromising politics. When the struggle comes, it is called fight to the finish. Try to fight out your enemy. but gandhi had a different understanding because he knew what was really at stake i mean whom are you fighting you are fighting the british and while fighting you and what for it is what is that you need to understand the colonial state and gandhi understood the colonial state as partly repressive and partly democratic it was partly benevolent and partly suppressive it was not fully democratic it's not like you know democratic uh, country whenever when the british uh, ruled india it was not uh, ruling india in terms of a democratic uh, it was not a it was not a democratic government it was rather a semi democratic uh, country because uh, if you look at the british rule what you see 
that british gave us judiciary british gave us uh, education british gave us rule of law british gave us uh, you know all kind of uh, governance structure but at the same time it never allowed us to rule us i mean it never allowed us political representation i mean it didn't give us uh, the right to represent ourselves or the self rule was denied to us it didn't give us independence so it kept us under their control of course they had their own explanation own justification saying that you know you are not fully developed you are not fully politically economically socially matured so as long as you are not matured we'll keep you we'll we'll put you under our control once you become once you reach that stage then we'll give you independence that is the kind of understanding they said that africans indians didn't have that uh, you know um, political maturity to rule themselves so they need some kind of stewardship they need some kind of you know mentorship and we were like interns you know indians were given some training so for 200 years they trained us that how to become a modern nation that was the idea so gandhi said that this is see they are you know partly violent partly authoritarian and at the same time partly democratic because they are giving you you know limited uh, you know political rights at the same time they're giving you education they're giving you judiciary they're giving you some of the things so in such a situation you cannot simply reject this ness and if you fight against this ness and violently you cannot because they you cannot simply win because they have immense resources they have at their disposal all technology all wealth compared to this you have been disarmed you don't you are a poor country so you cannot simply you know rally against this nation through a violent mode you cannot fight this rule called british military you cannot use your military force to fight out this british you cannot use you, you don't have immense resources to fight against them and at the same time you cannot simply reject these uh, you know ideas of democracy which are equally important for us and and he also saw then they also very strongly realized that the one of the major reason for uh, ruling india by the british has been a kind of you know important legitimacy they are enjoying they have made everybody understand that uh, that british is the my bab is the father mother of everyone because they are absolutely a modern democratic nation they are whatever they are doing in india they are not torturing people they are trying to develop they are trying to educate they are trying to give you know modern rule modern governance modern economy modern civil liberties everything so against this this idea of a benevolent rule which was very vivid which is very visible which is has just gone into the minds of the people that has really made people believe that british is the power of the world it's not only ruling india it is ruling most parts of the world and sun never sets in this empire it's so powerful it's very difficult to fight it's very difficult to fight this it's very difficult to fight this uh, british just a minute somebody is calling me
साहब काइंडली अनम्यूट योर माइक सर प्रोफेसर प्रोफेसर नंद सर काइंडली अनम्यूट योर माइक सर वी आर नॉट यस ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड सर ऑन द लेफ्ट लेफ्ट हैंड साइड देर इज ए माइक आईकॉन प्लीज अनम्यूट इट now is it okay yes sir yes sir please continue sir yes sir now it's okay but in the first part whatever i said whether there was a call you know by by to uh, respond to this that's why uh, you know there is a bit of distraction uh, was what uh, was it perfectly audible in the first part yes sir yes sir okay uh, uh, sir professor pp mr sir are you there professor mr is here Yes, sir. Is there? Can, can you can you hear me? Uh, what is the problem, sir? Professor, miss. Ha. Huh. Ask him to use the microphone. Oh, hello. What is the problem, sir? Can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. But yes. why don't you respond, sir? Please use your microphone. Is there any? So I would like to uh, again uh, reiterate this request to the students. If they have any questions, they can simply chip in. and they can simply okay, okay. come up with questions in between you just tell them huh? uh -huh. and uh, if they have not understood anything i was just trying to uh, i'd be really happy to get a quick comment from one of the students i mean if uh, they have understood something or there is some problem with uh, my way of you know explaining things or anything can i get a quick comment from anyone from any student anyone i'll be really happy Sir, can you please ask uh, some of your students uh, if they have anything to convey, or should I go ahead? Mm -hmm. Sir, Sir, hello. Doubt, doubt, doubt. What is the question? Do students? Sir, in, Sir, nineteen thirty-one to nine nineteen forty. Bhittare, मैंने तार achievement टा ठीक है कोई है सर मुं सत्रे ठीक confused है सी. Okay, but can you tell me your name? Uh, Naresh Kumar sir. So you are a, a, a person from um, Open University, huh? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll talk about that. Anyhow, good. Uh, 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 but what I was trying to the way I'm trying to explain this, I am trying to be, uh, you know basically uh, the, escape the, the the political achievement uh, uh, between sir 1931 to 40 sir. Yeah, that 42. I Yeah, I understood. Um, that ah, I'll yes. Yeah. But let me before that let me tell you that I was talking about uh, the implications, the importance of Gandhian politics, and I'll definitely come to that. You know, I'll try to cover this. Uh, uh, the, uh, let me quickly finish uh, the importance or the critical implications of Gandhian strategy. That Gandhi strategy was to to make people understand that uh, because they had tremendous fear they had tremendous respect for the british and gandhi's political intervention remained there to at least make people confident feel confident that they can fight this british they should come up with their own ideas their views their you know resources to fight the british uh, and they should 
in the course of participating in the national movement in in innumerable ways in their own ways they would gather confidence they would feel confident about the fact that they can beat this mighty rule and increasingly their fear their for british as the might empire will die down and the moral strength of the indians would rise high against the british because one of the major tactical mechanism of british has been to make people at least uh, remain at a level or at least uh, they have made indians feel that they cannot defeat the british against this gandhi's constant endeavor constant effort had been to inject a kind of confidence amongst themselves a kind of moral psychological political ideological confidence to build up this confidence amongst one and everyone to the poorest of the poor who is the dalit whether it is a tribal whether it is a peasant is a woman whether it is a boy whether it is a young man in the rural area whether it is a peasant whether it is a capitalist whether it is a mahajan whether it is a sahukar everyone all of them all indians should be invested with this anti imperialist consciousness so one of the major legacy of indian national movement was anti imperialism anti colonialism to fight against the british everybody should treat british as number one enemy maybe there is contradiction between a peasant and a sahukar between a worker and a you know capitalist these are secondary contradictions the primary contradiction being that everyone whether it is a peasant whether it is a woman whether it is a adivasi whether it is a dalit they had a fight or they had a kind of contradiction with number one enemy the only one enemy that is the british that 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 consciousness was one of the major legacy of indian national movement and secondly constantly spreading this idea of national unity has been a very profound achievement of gandhian movement so 1922 to 1947 this particular 20 30 years what you see a kind of movement which was being waged under the leadership of gandhi these two things one is this anti imperialist consciousness anti colonial consciousness along with this a kind of you know strong national unity these two ideas despite so many differences india is a country with so much of you know you know regions so much of languages so much of communities so much of religions so much of you know variations everything culturally socially economically you see lot of variations despite all diversities the one of the profound achievement of gandhi politics was to how to bring in this national unity by fostering by injecting by developing a kind of you know anti imperialist consciousness anti imperialist thinking so from these two fundamental aspects of national movement other things follow we need to see this now coming to your question what could be the major i mean you asked uh, what are the major developments of from 1932 uh, to 41 you asked me Nares, what did you ask? Nares, hello. Ha, sir, what were the political achievement uh, during nineteen thirty one to nineteen forty two? Political achievements. Yes, sir. What do you mean by political achievements? Okay. Political achievements. Uh, are you any any idea? I mean, you want to know? I mean, what exactly you mean by that political achievement? Yes. 
एक्चुअली सर व्हाट वेर द गांधीन स्ट्रेटेजी फॉर द फॉर द फाइटिंग अगेंस्ट ब्रिटिश ओके सो दैट्स अ गुड क्वेश्चन यू नो द पॉइंट इज if you look at uh, forget about only 30 to 41 why not even 20 to 42 or 47 whatever the same thing if you see broadly you see the full format of the vision of politics of economics of governance were laid down in this 30 years Who is this? Format of governance in terms of economy, in terms of polity, in terms of uh, social structure, everything was laid down. For example, you see that uh, democratic. I mean, if I talk talk about the rich political legacy, Gandhi. Encouraged participation of everyone in the anti-colonial movement. He was a person who hundred uh, percent supported this idea that everyone, irrespective of caste, creed, color, should participate in this mass movement. The idea of mass movement, which became very prominent in this particular. Uh, 20 years or 20 20 30 years that there is massive participation political participation of people in the anti colonial movement that led to democratization every one participated every one understood what is non cooperation movement the peasants in chaurichora understood this the peasants peasants in uh, andhra understood this in peasants in bihar understood this then why gandhi suddenly stopped this movement many people criticized it then uh, following this you know people started uh, going to the villages did the uh, 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 harijan work khadi work uh, village reconstruction gandhi said go back to villages if uh, that movement cannot continue all the time politics but politics has to continue after suddenly we drawing this movement in uh, after 1920 to chaurichora incident then they said that it doesn't mean that politics comes to an end that Gandhi, congress leaders should go to the villages try to organize uh, people in the villages and the rural people should be mobilized against the british how british is exploiting us how british is having uh, all sorts of you know policies which are against the country and uh, that has to be understood by everyone people should take to charka people should take to constructive activities that should be atma shakti that should be self reliance now uh, the present uh, budget which was uh, you know given to us uh, in the last uh, week talked about uh, atma nirbhar shilata these ideas now very clearly you know mirrors or illuminates the idea some kind of connect with this atma shakti this atma shakti this swadeshi movement this idea in 1905 this atma shakti we played with this idea this played with this vision so these are something which we always look back that we also tried this bengal national chemical industry in bengal which came up in 1905 it's a typical chemical industry at that point of time we floated in calcutta uh, to produce chemicals so that is one example my point is uh, by asking people to participate understand what is being what is happening in this country how british is ruling us how they are exploiting us how, one what way we can try to defeat them in what way we can mobilize them what we can organize them how can why should we read newspaper why should we read about uh, the politics being played around across the world what is happening in japan what is happening in vietnam what is happening in china what is happening in england what is happening in france or russia everything we should know and we should emulate we should 
follow their ideas try to also see that whenever that british is op, you know exploiting we should oppose them we should go for uh, whether we should be banner sena we should uh, resist uh, any the, the british uh, attempt to exploit us by participating in congress we should be a member of congress by buying a forana ticket we should uh, we are khadi we should have gandhi caps we should participate in uh, non violent activities we should follow gandhi's program we should take to charka these are you know kind of political strategy that we must adopt everyone whether he is educated whether he is ma whether he is a ba whether he is class fifth whether he has not read anything he is illiterate but he should understand that he has to be a member of congress he has to uh, you know follow or he has to believe in the basic idea that british is exploiting our job is to participate in this movement once everyone participates it becomes such a ferocious <laughs> movement and we fight so that idea of mobilization democratization very strongly developed this momentum grew as we you know went into 1920s and 30s and 40s you know look at the uh, magnitude of uh, the extent the nature of politics in the civil disobedience movement it was definitely horizontally developed non cooperation compared to non cooperation civil disobedience which happened in 1930 it was both vertically in terms of participation of different classes of people in terms of different regions of people in india it has really expanded women have started participating kisan sabha had come in you know state people's movement had come in in the garjar areas people have started integrating and there is uh, people from different other parts different other region northwest frontier ka abdul gafur khan these movements these people from different areas which were not earlier integrated in that this had come in so the movement was growing in momentum in number in size in extent in nature in character and also most importantly in terms of belief in terms of diversities earlier there was only you know moderates there was only extremists only tilak or um, uh, gokhale after gandhi came there is so much of difference which it came in swarajist non swarajist whether to enter into legislature or not whether centralist non centralist leftist rightist congress uh, socialist gandhians then kisan sabha you know um, communists congress socialist there are so many varieties of political formations all of them participated from 1931 they became very prominent they debate differ discuss issues congress almost all the congress sessions annual congress sessions remain divided by all these political and ideologically politically divided entities but nowhere you have seen that the, someone came so strongly in terms of their ideological position to make a road block for fighting against the british nobody opposed but fighting against the british everybody definitely had different political ideas ideological differences except that muslim league and uh, you know indian national congress differed more visibly after 1930 uh, 34 35 uh, and the demand of pakistan fructified bearing this you see that uh, left right center Uh, Swarajist, non-Swarajist, constitutionalist, non-constitutionalist, this uh, other you know um, strands of opinion, strands of ideas, ideologically polarized. They at least had a fundamental belief that they need to fight against the British. That minimum, irreducible minimum, was never threatened, was never compromised. So that was a broad consensus, consensus which kept developing. from 1930 what you see most importantly the idea of economic development fundamental rights was very clearly spelled out whether it has to be india had to develop a capitalist mode of uh, 
mechanism whether india had to be a, a capitalist kind of model or a socialist model or a gandhian model that came to be debated from 1930 but ultimately we remained firm with this idea that whatever development we take up it has to be state led state has to play a different very substantial role very central role state has to you know drive this what kind of economy will be followed in this country whether it is capitalism or socialism state will do this the state government of india government of federating units will be decisive people have to follow this they will and they will decide it on the basis of the mandate they have got from the people because people have elected these democratically elected governments and the state represented by this uh, mandate is the genuine authority to take a call on this whether we we need to follow uh, a kind of uh, model where we'll have a lot of investment from foreign capital or will have indigenous development whether we'll have a socialist mode of production or a capitalist mode of production everything will be decided by a independent government that is one thing we agreed and secondly we agreed that science technology based development has to be our, our mantra science technology should guide our notion of development science and modern science and technology whatever has come from europe whatever is believed in europe from 19th century we are not looking back to 14th century 13th century or to ancient period we are only looking we are only we are, we are really careful not to you know dilute our focus in terms of looking at this idea of modern science and technology that is what we need to do that is what we need to do so these are the two issues that on which we remain very firm uh, and this karachi resolution of 1931 which very clearly tried to talk about economic development and fundamental rights was very clear on this that it has to be you know based on it has to be a state led development it has to be uh, the key sectors of the economy whether it is uh, transport aviation waterways roads all major building activities of this country industries major industries will be under the control of the state defense industries and so that was the initial position that we took in 1931 and later on we also uh, i mean that uh, kind of perspective was also came to be countered by the fact that why not we have a because by then um, you know uh, both nehru bos and other congress socialist and communist had also uh, because of the influence of communist and socialist politics they have talked about uh, you know socialist mode of uh, control socialist mode of uh, model a socialistic model of development where the, instead of you know private profit or individual profit or where profit is more important or where means of production is owned by private interest which is basically the basis of you know capitalism is to be replaced or they they said that this should be replaced by a socialist model where cooperative profit is more important where state takes care of you know your the distribution of resources and owning of resources production of resources and distribution of resources becomes the responsibility of the state then we had a kind of you know feeling which was not very kind of mainstream idea but still then that idea remained with us for example gandhi always talked about village industries more power to people in the grassroots she said that uh, democracy will not be very strong unless the people at the bottom 
has that confidence in himself if it doesn't i mean if power doesn't go to that fellow who is the the least who is the suffering at the bottom if it doesn't go there so he talked about and gandhi was always very critical about science uh, i mean about technology over reliance on technology gandhi was not opposed to technology many of us try to tend to very over simplify by saying that you know gandhi was opposed to science and technology it's not like that or rather gandhi was a, gandhi had a view that we should minimize our dependence on technology we should not use technology in in a manner more than what is required or over reliance on technology should be reduced that was what gandhi always tried to you know emphasize and he said that you know decentralization he, he talked about decentralization of resources so whenever country became independent after 47 we had uh, i mean whenever we also prepare budget these days you know uh, after seven, for this 70 years we have never lost track of these ideas we give due emphasis to rural industries village industries khadi all these ideas and we always are very careful to see that how i mean this has become our mantra because gandhi popularized this idea that masses are important people are important people's democratic democratizations are important so every government whether it is right or left always talks about people talks about power to people that has been the legacy of national movement which cannot be compromised even if we wish even if we try to gloss over whatever we say we need to do politics in the name of people because this has been a kind of very inescapable reality with us so that is what you need to very clearly understand uh, that, that that is one similarly secularism is another dimension which which is very you know fundamental which is very you know critical also as an element because here the question is i mean many people think uh, talk uh, or uh, define secularism differently but one thing all of us should understand that uh, gandhi and nehru differed on the question of uh, understanding religion vis-a-vis -vis politics gandhi initially said that religion cannot be separated from politics because religion is not religions or different religions religion is like a moral force religion is like a moral force it's like a moral force so it's more important it cannot be i mean if you have to do politics it has to be part of religion so he had a different concept moralistic values of religion but nehru was opposed to religion because he found it to be you know dogmatic it found it to be you know kind of superst full of superstition it was very reactionary it was anti scientific it was anti progress something he saw it like that so that was the initial position of nehru but as time passed and both of them reversed gear gandhi realized that you know religion when it gets into politics a combination of religion and politics might be very explosive in terms of producing a communal overturn so we should desist from using more of religion into politics so as there was problems of handling indian uh, political problems in the 1930s and 40s gandhi very clearly articulated his views that no we need to be very careful about not uh, at least treating religion as a as the domain of private uh, at the level of privacy it is a it is a individuals private uh, domain religion should remain at the private domain of an individual it cannot be made public neither state should be anti religion nor it should try to promote or it should be antithetical to religion it should not be not anti religion 
or antithetical to religion. It should give equal weightage, all rights to everyone to express their, you know, consciousness, political and religious consciousness. But that should not come in to the level of, you know, while determining politics or while determining the activities of the state or power, state or government, this should not be, that should not be any confusion. It should not get into that. It should not be intruded. So the neutrality of religion from the domain of the state was something which was very sacrosanctly valued by the leaders everywhere and despite differences with Muslim League and everything we try to see that it doesn't you know get into a position where we you know the, the riots really go up or communal riots really come up similarly one thing you can see that how this consensus how despite so much of differences everything you know ultimately devolved around this question of maintaining a perfect uh, equilibrium as far as the anti-colonial thrust of the movement is concerned. For example, in 1931, this resolution on uh, this, uh, what you call, fundamental rights and the economic program was, this resolution was drafted by Nehru. Nehru was a socialist. He was a communist, as you know. And the president of this Congress Karachi session was Patel, who was a right. Gandhi moved this resolution. But this resolution very clearly said, as far as economic development is concerned, that it has to be, you know, controlled, or it has to be, you know, the whole, all the decision about economic growth, development will be taken by the state, or the state has to play a decisive role. And it has to be based on technology, science, and it has to, the key industries of the country will remain under the control of the state. And it also partly talked about capitalism. All these ideas of, you know, making full-fledged economic development of this nation and laying its foundation in 1931 as it was being done in most other parts of Europe, this economic uh, model based on capitalism as it has been adopted in other parts of the globe. Similarly, that model was also partly accepted in, in the, by, by Indian National Congress, though Gandhi was a person who was opposed to over reliance on technology was more clearly in favor of you know um, village industries, uh, village autonomy, uh, more power to villages, decentralization of resources. He talked about heavy industries and everything. And that proposal, which was drafted by Nehru, was mooted or was floated by Gandhi. So Gandhi proposed this. The proposal was drafted by Nehru, who was a left. Gandhi was himself a, you know, kind of person who was more, more pro-poor and Patel was a rightist, so-called rightist. So you see, left, right, pro-poor, everyone at least teamed together to see that the march goes on, that they are fighting against the British. They are trying to, you know, prepare a blueprint for the nation and they are moving forward. So this is what is important uh, as kind of legacy. You need to see that uh, that uh, how in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, the roadmap for this post-colonial nation was laid uh, by emphasizing on some of these areas, like whether it is civil liberties, whether it is economic uh, planning, whether it is uh, foreign policy, whether it is, uh, you know, national unity, whether it is a question of democratization of politics, whether it is, 
or, or making people more democratically conscious. One thing, one, one, um, one other aspect that I need to highlight is the fact that in 1931, everyone said there was a national franchise committee. The committee was formed to decide whether Indians should be given the right to vote or not. Because in 1930s, uh, at that point of time, uh, in Europe, that theory was going on. Uh, James uh, J.S. Mill, James Stuart Mill, uh, uh, had uh, drafted an essay called On Liberty and On uh, Representative Form of Government, where he argued that uh, in Europe, it is perfect that uh, people should be, you know, should uh, should have self-rule. But for people of Africa and India, they need to be trained in the art of self-rule. Because they are not yet trained, they are not yet politically matured, they need some time. And this is called, the, in, in other words, they are in the waiting room of history. These people, Indians and Africans, are not politically mature. They need to wait for some time. And British is making them really democracy fit by ruling them. By colonialism, by colonial rule, Indians are being made democracy fit or they are being fit to be democratic because slowly and steadily they are introducing so many reforms, political reforms, they are giving us education, judiciary, and we are getting educated, we are getting politically transformed. Then we'll, one day we become absolutely ready. That, uh, that, that idea was, was you know, advocated by J.S. Mill. And that theory, political theory, was accepted by many political theorists and everyone accepted it. But in 1931, when uh, Kong Kong, this country was getting ready that at one point of time British would leave, then how would you prepare uh, for our political rights or economic program? At that point of time, it was that whether people should be given, Indians should be given the right to vote to elect their government or not. At that point of time, a National Franchise Commission was set up. And that commission said, okay, look, it is not possible. First, people should be educationally I mean, they should be literate or education should proceed before political rights are given or people should be educated. And once they are educated, they can understand what is political rights. So unless until you are educated, you don't understand why should you vote, whom should you vote, what is ideology, what is political program, what this party is doing, what the other party is doing. But see, in India, when we, in 1950s, when we decided that everyone should be given the right to vote, everyone at a particular age, whether 20, now it is 18, so should be given, or 20, 21, he should be given, whether he is literate or illiterate, doesn't matter, he should be given the right to vote. A peasant in India should be given the right to vote. We thought that this is a great thing. I mean, Europe also hadn't tried this because they thought that political maturity can only be understood by someone who is educated. But we tried differently. We said no, because we people, the Indians, had participated in political struggles, non-cooperation, civil disobedience, quit India, so many struggles, so many stages, so many phases. They have seen intensely participated against all odds, gone to jails, you know, you know, gone, uh, went for dharnas, or they've been arrested, jailed, imprisoned. So it's not uh, required that they, they need to be educated. It's just not possible. So we defied this logic of James Mill and we defied this logic of uh, National Franchise Commission. And we made them, we made every, everyone, uh, you know, vote. And what we saw that every five years, whether people are educated or not, everybody votes. So we have a performative democracy. It is not a pedagogic democracy. Pedagogic democracy is that where, you know, democracy, the, the ideas of democracy, thoughts about democracy, theories about democracies are taught to you or are taught to someone in terms of a class, in terms of a discourse, in terms of ideas, in terms of debate, discussion, 
like intellectuals, they understand, then participate in democracy. But here, what we say, what we, we perform democracy, we go to votes. We, every five years, everyone has the right to vote. So that has been one of the very major uh, substantial legacy of this national movement. And that really happened uh, during this period in 30s, 40s, the way, way democratization took place, that ultimately climaxed with the confidence of giving everyone the right to vote, that right to franchise. That is something that we need to take note of. So uh, I think, Professor Mishra, uh, should I uh, stop here to take a few questions? Because Yeah, please do. Please do. Some questions uh, from I the learners or anybody else. Because just one, one second, I'll come from the toilet. Just one second. Now. Okay, okay, no problem. There are some doubt, some comment, or something. Come on, to our man. Faculty also should participate a bit. Doctor Sakir Hussain, Doctor Nakal Sain. Then Vigneshwar Raut, who is there? Let's make it more lively. Our numbers are few, but all we are interested, the interested persons, devoted persons. Naresh, you have any doubt? Yes, sir. OK, ask him. And on day after tomorrow, on Wednesday, he will be taking a class on science and technology. Dr. Nanda will take another class. Please remember and tell your friends. Naresh. Okay, sir. 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 Okay, Sir, mail da samosa check nine korbar to seta hoice kotha. Mail jana suche. Na mail da to asi jo. Uh Kintu samosa check nine korbar. SMS ta definitely samana dekhbe. Uh huh. So SMS ta asle bol hot. Koi ma pe? Koi hato hoice. So SMS kotha bata. Ha sir. Aapko department. Uh huh. Sir, pore sir jan mane. मेल नहीं पाई इसमें माने जॉन करवा तभी प्रॉब्लम हो चें ओ लिंक नहीं थी वह लिंक दरकार तो लिंक आ दरकार तो तभी प्रॉब्लम हो चें तो मैसेज दे देला सबूत दो बहुत सर हाँ पाई जब तो वहीं की जॉन हो गया हो हम्म आस्ट्रेलिया नहीं चंडी बाबू कैन यू हियर मी सर अच्छा यस यस चंदो बाबू Professor Nanda, thanks yeah. a lot for your no, no, I'll just, uh, quickly, yeah. I'll just quickly uh, add that one or two point by saying please, that. Please do. Uh, yeah. Uh, please do. The point, I was, the point I was trying to make uh, about this uh, uh, waiting room view of history. Uh, people, uh, because I was looking at your uh, reading resources uh, for this open university, which has been taken from IGNU. Uh, the way Salil Misra has talked about uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this particular unit, you people need to very clearly understand that uh, while talking about legacy, that waiting room, room view of history, as I said, that that Africans and Indians, the way J.S. Mill, particularly the theoretician, understood that uh, we need to go in stages. Or there is a stadial notion of development. There is a stadial notion, but stages notion of development, or this develop developmentalist notion of democracy. That democracy can come in developmentalist mode, or stages mode, or in stadial mode. That there has we have to wait for some time. That idea was very strongly defeated by Indian national movement, and that came in the course of national movement. That is what is important. And everything we learnt in the course of national movement, it was not inherent, it was not there. We became a people 
we were made a people in the course of the national movement. We are not a people as such. We came politically absolutely informed. Uh, we were not Indians who remained politically informed from the beginning, or we had inherent political consciousness like that. But the question is that in the course of national movement, by participating in whether it is 1885 to 1905, 1905 to 1920, or 1920 to 1942 in the under the Gandhian leadership, uh, uh, Gandhian movements, we developed so much of varieties of political perspective, political methods, political ideas, intellectual resources. All these ideas gave us a clear view. I mean, always we look back how we have fought against the British. And that idea, we gathered on these ideas, we reviewed these ideas and laid the foundation for our governance in the post-47 context. That is one we need to very clearly see. So as a result of which, we didn't either become a, you know, we became a civic uh, nation. We, be, we didn't become a religious uh, nation. We, we became a territorial nation. We didn't, we never became a, you know, ethnic nation, like uh, we didn't emphasize on one community, one tribe or one particular, uh, you know, religious community. And we became very plural, you know, there's so much of differences, so much of diversities, whether it is Patel, whether it is Subhas, whether it is Nehru, whether it's Gandhi, whether anybody, or whether it is uh, Molana Azad. So there's so much of diversities, but we at least had a broad consensus that we'd fight the British. So the nation, it was not a nation. Indian, mod, modern Indian nation was not a nation which was given. Uh, it was created in the course of the movement. That's why Surinath Banerjee wrote his famous book with the title Nation in the Making in the 1880s. So that is what makes Indian uh, nationalism very distinct. And we learned so many things and we try to, you know, use, incorporate these values into the making of a post-colonial nation. Some of the legacy still continues. We always tend to, you know, give high privilege or high premium to the category of people, because people have been the central foundation of this politics, of this nation. Nobody, whatever government comes, always thinks of people. Whatever budget comes, always thinks of people. And that foundation was given during Gandhi's period, because Gandhi made this mass movement absolutely a mind-changing game, a mind-changing politics across the world, nowhere, nobody, no power. I mean, it was a very interesting movement by any logic, because if you compare French, the Chinese, uh, or any other movement, Russian movement, you see here that a democratic or semi-democratic state was you know, transformed by moral, ideological, political battle. It was not overthrown overnight, like it was not a cadre-based movement. It was, it developed in different stages, different phases, different through different multiple political ideologies, but the target was one, to how to replace the British. And in the course of, you know, you know, struggling against one particular idea, so many diverse ideas came. We never conflicted. It continued in a different way. It's that is a rhythm in this, you know, disparity. There is a very perfect coordination, a very perfect rhythm in that whole cluster, you know, whole that, uh, you know, conflicting tensions, so much of uh, multiple positions. There was a kind of, you know, uh, you know, sort of, uh, what do you call it, a rhythm, a very fine tune somewhere. And that spirit is somewhat, though elusive, at the same time, it's very, what do you call, visible, is very palpable. It still continues, it still, you know, uh, continues to inform, continues to inspire the body politic of this nation. That is what we all post-colonial Indians, we all post, now not post-colonial, now we have to call ourselves as post-COVID Indians, you know, because this is COVID and post-COVID Indians 
it's a very serious tremendous responsibility on your part all of us to understand what this nation how this nation has been setting itself thank you i'll get back to you with your uh, if you have any questions i can come back again thank you yes tell me thank you professor nanda you have covered almost all the aspects of our nationalist movement and its legacy <laughs> you talked about appropriation in the present day of our national movement things like democratization things like the liberty fundamental rights and the karachi session then how we see as indians our nation today and i would like to point out one thing that we talk about our legacy but many a times i am not telling about any political party they say one thing do another thing are we really protecting the minorities the dalitas the minorities the women are we really thinking about our people or we are thinking about our political party so these things must be answered if we want to take india in coming centuries so we should follow the legacy of the nationalist movement in true sense of the term what will be your comment professor nanda on this yeah that's true so yeah but uh, um, as my point on my i just because this we you know this uh, begs a very serious critical exploration into different dimensions but yes but at least uh, to cut it short uh, students of social science particularly students of history those who are doing the, those who are the, trying to think through the ideas of modern india south asia they at least have a very serious responsibility of understanding the ethos that uh, ethos the ideological the political ethos which had largely shifted the consciousness of this modern nation or whatever a modern nation called india and the question also remains while trying to map this particular aspect while trying to think through this aspect the question again would come to understand what is this uh, idea of modernity and again um now uh, the the idea of nation nationalism has come under severe uh, criticism there has been very strong critic uh, on these concepts i think this is also very promising you know very provocative unless until some ideas are questioned are uh, put into intellectual interrogations no ideas moves forward so uh, i think as critical students of history we have a very you know major role to compare and contrast how this idea of modernity has shaped our understanding through these disciplines like whether it is anthropology or history or politics to develop our imaginaries about all these questions about nation its legacies about post colonial uh, societies and pro some problems like this as we are encountering today uh, like a both a crisis in terms of uh, public health and also managing a nation i think only social scientist with their with a very open ended perspective on how this particular nation particular region particular consciousness the way they have been saved can at least uh, do justice to answer i mean to to do justice to think about this question uh, by opening up you know uh, by if if we have a, a very you know fundamental understanding of how modernity has shaped our understanding of nation how industrial revolution has shaped our understanding of polity and 
what kind of ideology has been dominant in understanding the political order both in europe and in the non west and what kind of intellectual resources we have used to understand it for example the major question would come now uh, we of course we need to problematize this question of religion and politics i think uh, only superficially running away from this question saying that no once we try to discuss more and try to combine religion politics this would be explosive this would create very you know very dirty situation in the public it will be very contentious and this will hurt somebody and uh, also satisfy somebody that does and that's why we should remain away and there should be neutrality we should not antagonize we should not anti religion we should keep away from politics i think this is not a very tenable position it cannot be simply accepted because uh, you know that the social science uh, as social scientist and as social science if we live in a society which is basically quranic and puranic and you know, if we live through think through our puranic times all uh, the moment we wake up in the morning till we go to bed we do something uh, we remember god and uh, you know try to wish him or uh, ex you know, beg help from him all the moment or we do namaskar and everything so we are basically either puranic or a quranic people a muslim is quranic as hindus we are puranic all the time we do it but when we do you know academics when we do social science we say that no this is dangerous we should not touch it then why should we do academics because if we don't cannot cover our everyday experiences which is social science you know everyday experiences which is the basic foundation of social science then it's it's a criminal waste of time you know, i think it, uh, it's a, so these are uh, you know much more fundamentally challenged you know fund fundamentally uh, you know loaded questions that remains to be still answered uh, i think this 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 requires a separate session to discuss these things we can talk about that thank you very much for your very kind comments and also very serious interventions i mean coming up with this particular uh, kind of uh, question and perspective uh, which needs to be brought in while discussing any aspect of nation whether it in terms of legacy its implications or anything thank you anything else sir you want to say any more questions please otherwise we will wind up the session any more questions please i think professor nanda we have covered everything so there is no question to be asked okay okay <laughs> we have covered a, a to z a to z <laughs> and <laughs>